That's recording. Well, good morning. It's the 31st of March, 2024. And uh, we're in the House of God. We're looking at John chapter 11. I'm on page 1064 in the Old Bible. 1506 in the New Bible. Can we just pray, Lord? We thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our hearts for the Word of God. We thank you for the one who is the Word of God, who died and rose again. Rose from the grave, literally, physically, bodily, and has ascended to you to reign forever. But wonderfully, is even here with us this morning. This greatest of beings, the Son of the living God, who said, if two or three are gathered, I'm there in the midst, and we know that you're with us, we know that you're here, and we want to hear from you. You are the Word, you are the life, you are everything. We desire to hear from you. Amen. Now I'm looking at the question of resurrection, it being today, but we think about the resurrection much more frequently, don't we, than just once a year. It's, it's an absolute theme in our lives. Christ is risen. And uh, we have been raised with him in newness of life, and we are seated with him in heavenly places. That's what he has paid for, friends, and given to us. And um, this story in John 11 concerns Lazarus. There was this family of two sisters and a brother, Martha, Mary and Lazarus. And they lived a couple of miles away from Jerusalem and the Lord knew them very well. Lazarus is taken ill and he dies. And the Lord says to the disciples, right, we will go to Judea. And um, the Lord knew what was going to happen. And then you get in this um, uh, um, passage, the, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, verse 35. He didn't weep because of Lazarus. He knew Lazarus was going to be raised. He wept at that view of death, you know, the place of corpses, burial, cemetery. And it's a great reality, friends, that affects every human being. I mean, it's uh, amazing that people aren't more concerned about their, the end of their lives, because it's coming so fast to all of us, like an express train. And um, I'm in verse 23. Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. It's a truth. Everybody will rise again. Everybody's going to be raised from the dead. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said to him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Your brother will rise again. What does, when he says he will rise again, what does he mean? What does that mean? I mean, it's a body that was buried. And you're not your body, are you? No one is. I mean, we occupy this body and we um, act out various things through using this body, but we are not our body. We're not our body. And I'm... You know, but sometimes on the street, when we're one of the lines I take with people is this. You know, I say to people, "What would happen if you didn't eat for six months and then stopped drinking?" It, well, I would die. No, you wouldn't die. You would leave your body. It's a completely different concept, friends. It's like saying, "He that believes in me shall never die." His body might go, but he's not going to die because he has eternal life through faith in Christ. That's what he. That's what he means by that. All of us will, this thing we live in is going to die in the sense that we will discard it, it will finish, it will end its ability to function. That's going to happen to everybody. 
It's an inevitable, isn't it? But it, that's not me. It's not me. And uh, I do, I don't want to just move away from the importance of the body because I make that point, because actually the body is incredibly important. And I'm um, in 1 Corinthians 9, page 1139 and uh, 1612, where Paul speaks himself about the, <clears throat> the need to control the body, to control it. And um, it's quite powerful how he puts, I'm in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25, he says, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it, meaning athletes, natural athletes, ordinary men and women of course, but athletes. They are temperate. They don't overeat. They don't get drunk and can't get up to practice their football or whatever it is. They are temperate. They know the body has got to be controlled or it will control them. But he's saying this to Christians and it concerns a great spiritual truth. And so much turns on this according to what he says. I therefore so run, in verse 26, not as, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. You know, like a box who just punches air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He, he recognises the potential in his body if it is not controlled and made subject to his spirit, the potential in his body for the destruction of his soul. That's what, that's what he is saying. And it is your eternal soul that matters, isn't it? And I pray that that point from 1 Corinthians 9, the, 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 way, the point that Paul makes about the importance of controlling his body, his natural passions, natural physical weaknesses, and all of that, I hope that that will get right into our hearts, friends, because it is of immense importance. And your soul is what matters. It's what matters. And see, well, I... Use, I'm using my body now. Pick this up and read it. And what my hands? I'm using them. You know, my hands. It was, bit, it was my hands that did that. I did that. What you watch. It's, you know, the things maybe you shouldn't watch. Your eyes are watching. It's not your eyes are watching them. You are watching those things. You are watching them. And, um, Look at what people have done with their bodies. Well, I don't like to go into the details. Some have said, said I mean, the, the people have killed people. That, well, the finger pulled the trigger. It wasn't the finger. That person pulled the trigger. That eternal being that occupies that body and uses that body. Or, and here's the importance of the body, gives it to God. And I will read in, um, I hadn't planned to, but you know in Romans 12, where this is so plainly put. And I'll just give you the, um, you easily find it on page, um, oh, 1128. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So why do bodies die? There's a very simple word, sin. The wages of sin is death. And uh, I'm back in Hebrews 9, I'm picking up a couple of scriptures, so I'm on page 1195 and 1690 in the New Bible, Hebrews 9 verse 27, 
And here, here's an account, or at least an exposition of the, the truth concerning the death of Jesus Christ and his high priestly office and how he offered his blood, not like the old priests who offered the blood of animals that had been sacrificed that could never take away sin, but offered his blood to remove our sin. And then it's a, it's a once and forever thing. When he cried out on the cross, it is finished, that rang through eternity. Time and eternity. Once and forever, God's Son died for our sins. He's not going to die again. There's not an annual presenting of animal blood. That's all finished. This is the great sacrifice of God for our salvation. This is the great high priest. Not like those high priests who all died and their sons took over. And they once, a, once a year went trembling into the presence, into the holiest place. Completely different. 25 of Hebrews 9, not yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others, then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Can I just as an aside say how that truth knocks out the idea of reincarnation. You know, endless lives, endless deaths. A kind of progress into a different spiritual being. Once to die, after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered, once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, without sin unto Salvation. Now this certainty about resurrection unto judgment was the reason St. Paul gives for his motivation for the life that he lived, the ministry that he performed, the preaching of the word of God, the, the, the conversion of thousands, the work in the churches to watch over them, to correct them, to strengthen them, to feed them, all of that. He gives a reason for it. Now I'm in... in um, Acts chapter 24, and page 1110 and 1571, New Bible. But in, in Acts 24, when he's, he's being, he's on trial, he's having to justify and explain what he does and why he does it. And um, I'm in verse 15. I have hoped toward God, <clears throat> which they themselves all see to the Pharisees, they allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust, the good and the bad, all human beings, dead and buried from, from the first corpse to the, to the last, will be, will be raised, everyone, good and bad. And, and then he says, and herein do I exercise myself, to have always, and can I, can I ask to really think about this, friends? It's what Paul is saying, and he, he's explaining himself. He's, he's giving the reason why he is what he is, and he does what he does. And his allegiance to the gospel of Jesus Christ, his sense of the importance of his message, every effort that he makes to give that message out to those who are dying in their sins, who one day are going to be resurrected, to heaven or to hell. That's, and he knows that. That's the reason he gives for what he's doing. And, then he, and, and the reason he gives for his own spiritual process. Herein do I exercise myself. I'm busy with this. I'm engaged in this all the time. To have a conscience void of offence toward God and toward men. I don't want any stain left on my soul. I don't want anything that on that day when I'm raised to stand before God, I will be censured and condemned. I'm all the time making sure that what I, what I teach and preach, says Paul, or could have impliedly, that man can be forgiven his sins, 
can be made into a new creature, can be a child of God, can know truth, can have the light of life, can one day arrive in heaven in God's presence. And it is sin that ruins it, and sin that has been dealt with by Christ on the cross. And that is what he's teaching. But he makes it real for himself. I'm not going to let sin happen to me, or if I do, I will quickly get right with God. I will live a life, night and day, before God Almighty and before other men, that is impeccable. And through the grace of Jesus Christ. And the, and the, the reason that he gives, I know there's going to be a resurrection of everybody, good and the just and the unjust. It's going to happen. And to, the, to, to, to death, either to go into eternity, unsaved with all my sins, or to go to Christ, sinless through his righteousness, ready for God, ready for his holiness, ready for eternity, ready for the glory that Christ has won for us. Now, salvation is everything, friends. We, we fallen creatures need more than anything, don't we? Our need is Christ. And I'm going back to John 11, the, thing, the things that Jesus says uh, to Martha, they're at, the, they're at Lazarus' grave, Lazarus is dead and buried. They're at his graveside. And, and he says in verse 25, I am the resurrection. And the life. It's interesting, isn't it, that Christ is certain things. He is those things. People say, well, truth. Well, this is, this Bible, this is truth. The scriptures are truth. Of course they are. But really, Christ is true. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's personal. It, it's a, it focuses right in on the, on the Son of God. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the bright and morning star. I'm the alpha and omega. I'm the king of kings. I'm the prince of peace. It all focuses for salvation on Christ. And uh, when he puts the question, which we read in <clears throat> verse 26, uh, well, he makes a statement, but he asks, do you believe it? And it's a bit important point, isn't it? Do we believe it? Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He will leave his body, of course, but not to, de not to go to death, not to go to that place of darkness and separation from God forever. That will not happen to those who believe in Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen to them. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The answer she gives is perfect, isn't it? In verse 27, she said to him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And we know that he came into the world to die for our sins. And um, in John 1, <clears throat> the beginning of John's Gospel, Page, page 1049 and uh, 1484. And remember how uh, John the Baptist, not John the writer of the Gospel, not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist, um, there's an account of what he has been called to proclaim concerning Jesus. And um, I'm in verse, well, let's just pick up a couple of vital things. You know, the... Um, Verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bare witness of him, in verse 15, and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that comes after me is prepared before me, for he was before me in eternity. And we are not eternal, friends. We are everlasting, but we're not eternal. We had a beginning. At a beginning, we, won't, we, are, we, are, we won't come to an end, we will exist forever. But the divine being had no beginning, no beginning. And John the Baptist is saying, 
He's, he's before me, and he was before me in eternity. And, um, and verse, I'm looking at verse 29. The next day, John sees Jesus coming to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And uh, that's a picture, of course, of Christ, our Passover. We looked at that last week, I think, or maybe on Thursday, I can't remember, but uh, which is a reference to the when the Jews were protected from the avenging angel that brought death across Egypt. And uh, the Jews had to take a perfect year-old lamb, perfect, no blemishes, kill that lamb, put his blood on the doorposts, and the angel of, De- of wrath passed over them and he's, that's, what, that's what John is, John the Baptist is, is referring to the Lamb of God Christ Jesus which takes away the sin of the world now we are commemorating and I hope with tremendous joy and thanksgiving the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and I just want to put this question and make this point Does it really matter that Christ rose? Does it matter? Actually, everything depends on it, friends. I'm in 1 Corinthians 15, um, page 1145 and 1619. This is the great chapter on resurrection, but the importance of it couldn't be overstated more than is put here. It's important. And um, I'm reading verses 13 to 17 and 1 Corinthians 15. Page 1145 and 1619. Verse 13. If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain empty, pointless, and your faith is also empty and pointless if Christ isn't risen. Yeah, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if it be that the dead don't rise. We've been giving a false account, a false story, if it isn't true. If it isn't true. And um, if the dead rise, verse 16, if the, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ risen. And here is the real crunch. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. You are still in debt to God and the debt hasn't been paid. If Christ isn't risen. That's, that's how important the resurrection is. And it's very straightforward because we know that what paid our sins, paid the price of our sins, the unpayable debt, the debt of guilt, was the sinless life of Christ poured out as a sacrifice. That paid our debt. And what proves that that life was sinless? The resurrection. You go through a cemetery, you look at the... They're all, they're, they're all down there, aren't they? And, you know, the, and what is it that has kept people in their box, in the ground, and, and they've begun to rot? What, what has done that, friends? Their guilt, their sin. It's, it's very, very serious, this truth. And what proves that Christ never sinned? Death couldn't hold him. There was no charge sheet... How the devil would have loved it if there was, because he defeated the devil by dying. He, by death, he defeated him that has the power of death. So if, and if Christ didn't rise, then the sacrifice didn't work because he wasn't a sinless soul. It, that wasn't sinless blood. That's how important it is. That's how important it is. And uh, the, the statement that Martha makes, 
is, is that's the real issue in this chapter in a way. Do you believe this? She said, yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And can I just say this? I've got one more, two more points. Through. This is a double point, but look. Um, we must have these two certainties for our salvation. That Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago, is the son of the living God. And secondly, he did rise from the dead. Two essentials if we are to be saved. And thank God they're both true. That's the great thing about them. Is it's not a story, friends. It's not wishful thinking. It's the great reality that saves the human soul. He is the Son of God. He did die for our sins. He did rise from the dead, literally, physically, definitely. Certainties that give salvation as we put our faith in him and in the truth about him. Now the last point is this. Don't let fear or reluctance put you off. It's interesting in the the account that we get in, I'm back in John 11, the page um, 1063, where um, they've heard that Lazarus is ill, and the Lord said, right, we'll, we will go. I said, we can't go there. They, the last time we went there, they, tried, they were going to stone you to death. Verse 8, his disciples say to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you. Are you going there again? And then he, ma- he makes this point, which... I hope I can convey it, well, God will convey it to us, all of us. He said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. If man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there's no light in him. And these things said he, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go to wake him out of sleep. Now, he knew he died. But what he's saying is this. You don't let any perceived danger, any perceived uncertainty, anything anything that could undermine your journey with Christ, don't let it get in the way. If you do, you're not going to be in the light of the daytime. That's what that means. They're saying, you don't go there, they'll stone you. He just transcends the problem and he gives this principle, doesn't he? There's 12 hours in a day. There's plenty of light. Plenty of light. If you walk in the light, you'll have the light of life. And don't let anything put you off. And so, David, thank you. The, the, um, in a minute, the... Um, the journey is into light, isn't it? And the expression which Martha gives, and we've looked at resurrection and we know that Christ is risen. And we have that, particularly today, but every day, it's a joy and a wonder to us. But when, when, he, when, he, when he says to look, <laughs> he, um, I read 25, I'm, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And then she expresses the essentials for light for human souls. Yes, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which would come into the world. Thank you. And that is what we believe, friends, and know to be true. Thanks very much.